a story I learned from one of my professors in college. It was about Gertrude Stein on her deathbed. And every, all of the literary Paris had learned that Gertrude Stein was about to die, so they gathered around to hear her last words. And so she raised her head from the pillow at one point and said, What is the answer? Put her head down. And everybody around the bed kind of shrugged their shoulders. What do you say? And then she raised her head one last time and said, But well, what was the question? <laughs> Passed away. Now you can listen to that story in two ways. One is to think, good old Gertrude, anything for a laugh. Um, <laughs> and the other is, you know, she had a point. It's, the question is actually more important often than the answer. And there are two other stories, that, or two other quotes I've come across that illustrate this point. One was a quote by Thomas Pynchon, uh, which is that if they can get you to ask the wrong questions, then it doesn't matter what answers you come up with. Um, and another from a writer whose name I've forgotten, talking about how, as, as a child, he went to school in New York. His parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe, and they were very concerned that he make the most of his education to get ahead in the world. And every day after he'd come home from school, his mother would ask him about the day at school, but she would never ask him, what did you learn? She would always ask him, what questions did you ask? And a very smart, smart mother. So with those thoughts in mind, I'd like you to think about another deathbed scene, uh, which is the Buddha's on his deathbed. We all know, or most of us know, his last teaching, which was about heedfulness. You have to be heedful because things change. As he said, fabrications are inconstant subject to change, subject to ending. And therefore, we should bring our practice to consummation through heedfulness. That was his last teaching. But do any of you know what he did just before his last teaching? Remember? Have you ever read the story? Does it... He opened the floor to questions. He asked you, do you have any last questions about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, or the path of practice? I always thought that was very impressive. I mean, he was dying. <laughs> And yet he says, okay, one last chance to ask questions. And he repeats the request four times. And usually in, in ancient India, you repeat, re, repeat a quest three times, shows you're serious. In this case, he repeated it four times. The last one, we said, well, maybe some of you might be embarrassed, so you speak to a, the monk sitting next to you if you have any questions. But nobody spoke. Um, and I think one of the important points of this particular part of the story is that the emphasis that the Buddha gave to asking questions. It was an important part of his teaching. He once said that he trained his students in what he's called cross-questioning, which means if there's something you don't understand, you ask, what is the meaning of this? How does this fit in with other things that you've taught? And he contrasted this with what he called training in bombast, um, in which people listen to literary works, poetry, with nice vague meetings, but they're never really encouraged to question, well, what do these terms mean? What, what, what are you talking about? Um, the term that he gave to this ability to look at questions and to ask the right questions is he called appropriate attention, yoniso manasikara. He said it's the internal quality that's most effective for gaining awakening, knowing which questions to focus on, which questions to put aside. In fact, he once said that this is a measure of a person's wisdom, is how you approach questions. Now, most of us, when we hear discussions of Buddhist wisdom, tend to sound like vocabulary lessons. You know, this is the meaning of not-self, this is the meaning of emptiness, this is the meaning of Buddha nature, or whatever. But that's not how the Buddha defined wisdom. It's when you're asked a question, how do you approach the answer? It's not necessarily what answer you to give, but you actually how do you approach the question. And he said there are actually four ways that you can approach questions. One is to give a straight answer. And he said some questions deserve a straight answer. Um, and this doesn't mean that other questions deserve a crooked answer. What it means is that other questions need to be analyzed. That's another approach. You reanalyze the question before you answer it. Um, the primary case or primary example in the canon is where one time a prince had been told by some members of another sect. He said, hey, do you want to become famous? Go ask a question the Buddha can't answer. And the question was going to be this, would the Buddha ever say something that was displeasing to other people? And what they were hoping for is either the Buddha would say yes or no, and if he said no, then say, well, we have you, you know, on record having called your cousin Devadatta a lick spittle. Uh, isn't that a cool term? <laughs> Don't you wish we could revive that term? Again? <laughs> 
<laughs> lick spittle means somebody else spits something out and you lick it up. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the Buddha had quite a vocabulary. Um, and if the Buddha said, yes, he would say displeasing things, then you could say, well, what's the difference between you and every ordinary person down in the market? They say displeasing things too. And so the prince goes to ask the Buddha a question, this question. And after he poses the question, the Buddha said, that's not the, question, the sort of question that deserves a categorical answer. You don't answer that question straight on. He said it deserves an analytical answer. And the Buddha then goes on to analyze the sorts of things he would say. It's okay if it's... He would answer. He would say something only if it was one true, and then if it was true, the next question is: Is it beneficial? If it wasn't beneficial, he wouldn't say it. If it was true and beneficial, then the next question would be: Is this the right time and place to say something pleasing? Is this the right time and place to say something displeasing? And he gave an example to the prince. He said, "You've got the, the prince had a baby infant um, lying on his lap. He said, suppose your baby infant got." A piece of glass. They didn't have glass in those days. They had a piece of um, a piece of a pot, basically, caught in its throat. What would you do? But suppose he took it in his mouth. What would you do? And the prince said, "Well, I would hold his hand with one hand, and then with my other finger, reach into his mouth and get it out, even if it meant drawing blood." And why is that? Because I have compassion for the child. And the Buddha said, in the same way, there are times when I have to say displeasing things to people to save them from their own their own wrong views. And so that was a case of a question that deserved an analytical answer. Now in the course of giving that analytical answer, the Buddha also did a cross-questioning, which is the third way of approaching questions, which is you ask questions of the questioner first before you give an answer. We'll go into this a little bit more in, in detail in a moment. And then finally there's the fourth sort of question, which is questions that don't deserve an answer at all, you put them aside. Um, cases like, um, what am I, who am I, what is my true nature? Most of Western philosophy, the Buddha said, put it aside. <laughs> uh, is the world eternal? Is the world not eternal? Is it finite? Is it infinite? He said, put it aside. And his main reason for putting it aside was says it doesn't help in putting an end to suffering. You can spend a lot of time asking those questions and they really don't get you anywhere. You've probably heard the story of the man shot by the arrow, where he's, you know, he's been shot by an arrow, he comes to the surgeon and he says, no, wait a minute, before you take out the arrow, I want to know what kind of wood the arrow was made out of, what kind of feathers were used, the person who shot me, what was his caste. Um, and as the Buddha said, if you try to answer those questions, you would die first before I got the arrow out. And so, so a lot of these questions that people tend to ask are a waste of time and actually get in the way of the practice. So those are the types of questions that deserve to be put aside. So we have four ways of approaching a question. One is giving a categorical answer, yes, no, or a straight answer to what the question was asking. Second one is reanalyze the question, add a few more variables before you answer the question. The third one is to cross-question the person who's asking you the question. And then the fourth is to put the question aside. Now of these, I think one of the most interesting categories is the category of questions that deserve cross-questioning. Now there are three primary functions when the, where the Buddha uses the word cross-questioning. One is while a person is teaching, um, he would cross-question the person he's, who's listening to him, exploring analogies and examples together with the student to make sure the student understands the teaching and how to apply it, as in the case with the prince. He gave the example of the, of the infant. So what would you do if you had a case like this with your infant? The, the prince answers and the Buddha says, okay, now you've basically answered your question about how you should speak. Um, there's another meaning of cross-questioning, which is while you're sitting and listening to a teaching, if there's something you don't understand, you ask, okay? which is what the Buddha encouraged. And then finally, the third sort of type of questioning is once you've listened to the teaching, then you take some questions home with you and you ask yourself about what you're doing in the present moment. In other words, you take the teachings and you try to apply them to your actions in the present moment. One is it's a way of testing the teachings to see if they really are relevant to your life. And then secondly, to see if your, te if your actions actually live up to the, the standards that are established by the teachings, to see if they really are skillful. This last aspect of cross-questioning requires very high standards, and we can see this from the Buddha's own life. You look at his quest, and it was framed in terms of questions that he asked himself. It starts out when as a young prince, he had all the, the pleasures and all the wealth and all the power and all the beauty that he could want. But at one point he asked himself, he says, wait a minute, 
Here I am, subject to aging, illness, and death. Why is it that I'm looking for my happiness in things that are also subject to aging, illness, and death? Why don't I look for something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die, as a basis for my true happiness? So this is the first role of questions in, the, in our quest for awakening, is to sense that there's a lack in our life, something's wrong in the way we're acting, and try to stretch our imagination to see if there are other ways of acting, other ways of approaching a particular problem. And so the Buddha, in this case, started looking for what, as he said, he searched for what was skillful in, in leading to a, what was the deathless. And after some, some pretty strong wrong terms on the path, he said he finally got on the track with the question, why don't I start divide my thinking into two sorts, skillful and unskillful? And so he looks at his thinking and he realizes that the th thoughts that are unskillful are the ones that are imbued with sensual desire, imbued with ill will, imbued with cruelty. This kind of thinking really is unskillful. He says he tries to put a stop to it. He says as if a cowherd um, during the rainy season, he has to watch out that his cows don't go into the rice fields. And this is in Asia. This used to be one of the big problems. You know, when the rice is growing, you don't want the cows going into other people's rice fields because they're going to get you. Uh, um, when Indian civil servants went to Ceylon and, and acted as ju judges in villages, they found that this was the big issue: was getting the cows out of the rice. And so, if you're a cowherd at that time, you have to be very careful to make sure the cows don't go into the rice. Okay. He says, but what about skillful thinking? Okay, skillful thinking that is free from sensual desire, free from ill will, free from cruelty. Now, he says, in a case like that, you don't really have to worry about your thoughts because they're not going to lead to anything unskillful. He says, the same t in the same way as a cow herd during the dry season, the rice has been harvested, the cows can go anywhere they want, nobody's going to complain. So you just sit under a tree and just keep yourself mindful, okay, there are cows over there someplace. I'll have to bring them in in the evening, but otherwise I don't have to worry about them. In the same way, if your thoughts are skillful in this, in this way, that you're not thinking about sensual desire, you're not thinking about harming other people or wanting other people to suffer, you don't have to worry about your thoughts. Except, as the Buddha said, if you think that way all day and all night, your, the mind's going to get tired. And so he said it would be more skillful to bring the mind into concentration. So this is how he brought his mind into the first factor, or the most important factor of the path, which was practicing jhana. In the course of doing this, he gained three knowledges. Knowledge, is knowledge of previous lifetimes, knowledge of how beings die and are reborn, <coughs> and finally knowledge of how to put an end to the causes of suffering. Now, in the course of getting those three knowledges, those first two knowledges actually could have formed a trap for him. Because there are lots of cases of people prior to the Buddha who gained knowledge of previous lifetimes, saw how beings arise, after having passed away from one life going one, one life into the next. And they did not use that in the most skillful way. They set themselves up as teachers and say, hey, I've seen the true nature of reality. You want to know? I'll tell you about it. Rebirth is true. Okay. Now the Buddha realized that, that that was not the most skillful use of that knowledge. And that was the question he asked himself. What is the most skillful use of this knowledge? He's looked at the way people die and are reborn and he says that their views or intentions are important. It determines how you get reborn. So he said, well, where are intentions happening in my mind right now? They're happening right now, right here. Let's look into the mind right here in the present moment. So taking that knowledge, he directed it, looking in his mind at the present moment, to see how intentions were causing suffering in the immediate present. And then he saw how aging and death happened in the present moment, the aging and death of mind states, and he traced it back, finally, to back to ignorance. And in this case, he didn't have any, didn't make reference to who was doing this, whether there was a self who was doing this or there was no self who was doing this, just looking at the events as they were present to his awareness. He didn't ask himself whether there was a world of reality behind the appearances, and he didn't ask himself whether there was no world behind there. Just a question of looking at events in and of themselves. And looking at things in this term enabled him to gain awakening. Now the lessons he learned from this are, one, his entire search was guided by cross-questioning. He kept asking himself questions about what he was doing. And this is why he made cross-questioning such a central, uh, play such a central role of his, in his teaching style. Secondly, he realized that wrongly framed questions can lead a person astray. You know, you, there was one point where he had this image that appeared to his mind that a person who is going to gain awakening has to be like a piece of wood who's far away from water. 
And in this case, the water here stood for sensual desire. And so he said, okay, I'm going to deny myself all, all pleasures of all kinds. And he realized afterwards that that was the wrong interpretation of, the, um, of that particular image, because he went through six years of self-torment and didn't get anywhere with his practice. So he realized if you frame your questions wrongly, you can suffer for quite a long time. Third, he realized that you need to have high standards in judging the results of your actions. Prior to his going, practicing his self-torment, he studied with two teachers, and they were content with their concentration attainments. One had reached the stage of nothingness, another had reached the stage of neither perception nor non-perception, and they said, hey, this is it. This is, it far, this is as far as anyone can go on the path to putting an end to suffering. And the Buddha himself realized that this was not the case. In fact, later on he said, one of the two most important qualities that led to his awakening was that he did not remain content with skillful qualities in his mind. Because as long as there was still suffering in his mind, he said, okay, things are, things are not still good enough. Remember that, non-contentment. That's how he gained awakening. Okay. Um, fourth point he realized was that he, putting aside unskillful frames of reference is essential to focus on it, issues that really can lead to the end of suffering. In other words, his third knowledge, where he didn't worry about beings or worlds, but just looked at events in his mind and see, okay, where is, what events in my mind are causing suffering right now? What can I do to put an end to those? Therefore, one of the functions of cross-questioning is to test whether the framework of your original question really is appropriate. I mean, are you asking yourself the right questions? Or like Thomas Pynchon, are you, you know, saying are you being misled by asking the wrong questions? In this case, you're often misleading yourself. And from his own cross-questioning, he found that the most useful frame of reference for putting an end to suffering were basically two issues. One is the question of what is skillful and unskillful, and the second is questions in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Now one of the most striking things about this story of how he gained awakening is that issue of non-contentment. You know, we're often taught that acceptance, contentment are an important part of the practice, but again the Buddha kept saying again and again that essential to his awakening was not letting himself rest content with his skillful qualities. And one way out of this dilemma, or this, co this conflict here, you can find in his teachings to his son Rahula on equanimity and patience. Now before he taught Rahula Beth meditation, he taught him patience, he taught him equanimity. He said, try to make your mind like the earth. People spit on the earth, people throw urine and feces and other things on the earth, and the earth doesn't get upset. He says, try to make your mind like that. No, he doesn't say, stop there. Then the next thing he says, okay, when you train your mind to be like that, now you're ready to practice breath meditation. Now when you're practicing breath meditation, you're not just watching the breath with equanimity. You train yourself to breathe in certain ways so that you can understand cause and effect in the mind. So what the Buddha is basically telling him to do here is that acceptance or equanimity is a prerequisite for seeing cause and effect, what is skillful and what is not skillful. But it's not, you're not meant to rest content with what is skillful, much less with what is unskillful. You're trying to figure out how things work so that you can manipulate them in a skillful direction. And the only way you can see how things actually work is if you have a certain level of equanimity, a certain level of acceptance for the way things are. You can compare this with a, scient a scientist. You have to be patient and you have to be dedicated to the proper method in order to get reliable results. Also like a scientist, you have to be very, very careful in how you design your experiments. And we'll run into this a little bit in a minute. And the Buddha talks about heedfulness as an important quality that you need to develop in the practice. He says, heedfulness is the basis of skillfulness. Now he's not saying you have an innate nature that is basically skillful or unskillful or good or bad. But you have to be alert to the fact that your actions really do have results. And they can be really good or really bad, so you have to be careful about how you, how you act. So what are some of the questions that the Buddha recommended people to ask? First question, he says, is how you look at any potential teacher. He says, does this person have any qualities that would make him lie or her lie to me about what they knew? I mean, do they have the greed that would make them lie and say that they knew something they didn't know? Or do they have the anger that would make them lie? Or the delusion that would make them lie and say they knew something that they didn't know? So the first question you want to ask is, check out your teacher. Okay. okay, once you've got a teacher that you think is reliable, then the next thing is you're going to ask that person. Um, you see, you're going to ask them, what is skillful? What is unskillful? What is blameworthy? What is blameless? 
what should be cultivated, what should not be cultivated, what, when I've done it, will be for my long-term harm and suffering, or what, when I've done it, will be for my long-term welfare and happiness. Now the Buddha said these questions are the beginning of wisdom, particularly those last two. What, when I've done it, will be for my long-term harm and suffering, and what will be for my long-term welfare and happiness. The reason these questions are wise are, one, you show you realize that your happiness or suffering depend on your actions. They don't just come floating through. Secondly, long-term happiness is better than short-term. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? How many people live by that, though? <laughs> There's a passage in the Dhammapada um, that if a person sees a, a lesser happiness, uh, excuse me, a, a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, you should be, the enlightened person would be willing, willing to abandon the lesser happiness for the sake of the greater happiness. Now there's a famous Pali translator from England who said this could not possibly be the meaning of that, that verse. Why? Because it's so obvious. But then again, as you say, how many people actually live on the principle, I want long-term happiness and I'm willing to sacrifice long-term happiness for short-term happiness? Not that many. Excuse me, willing to sacrifice short-term <laughs> happiness. I've been living in America too long. Um, <laughs> I have a friend um, who writes novels, and she wrote a novel recently, on, on a, and she teaches in university, and of course, once she writes her novels, then she gets invited around to the alumni, alumni clubs to read from her novels, sign copies of the books. And she told me one time in her last novel, and when you, when you read from a book like that, you have to choose an incident from the novel that's self-contained that you can read in 20 minutes and people will understand. And so the one incident she took out of her novel was about a young woman in, I think it was 17th century China. Her mother dies, her father goes off, excuse me, her father promises that he's never going to marry again, that he's going to spend all this time looking after his children. And so the girl has some sort of sense of confidence that her father will do this, look after her. And then what does he do? He goes off on government business down to the southern part of China, comes back with a new wife, a courtesan. The girl is just totally distraught. Well, the new wife is no dummy. You know, she wants to be a good mother. And so one night they're playing chess. And she's explaining to her daughter that you know, if you really want to be happy in this lifetime, you have to decide there's one thing you want more than anything else and be willing to sacrifice everything else for that one thing. Now the daughter's kind of listening, kind of not listening, the way daughters are. <clears throat> but she's beginning to notice that her mother's a really sloppy chess player, and she's losing pieces all over the board. And so the daughter starts getting more and more aggressive in her playing. And of course she falls into the mother's trap, the mother checkmates. Her. And so the way the mother is playing chess, of course, is illustrating her point. You want checkmate, you've got to be willing to lose some important pieces sometimes, but you, that's how you win the game. And my friend told me that after reading this particular passage from her novel to two or three alumni clubs, she had to stop. She said, nobody wanted to hear the lesson. Everyone wants to win at chess and keep all their pawns. You know? so, so, this is why the Buddha said, the beginning of wisdom is realized. It is these questions, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness, i.e. my actions are important and I want long-term happiness and so I'm willing to sacrifice short-term. Other questions that the Buddha recommended that people ask, and again, here he's talking to his son Rahula. You know, we can think about general principles about what's skillful and what's not skillful, but you actually have to test things for yourself in your actions. And he told his son, before you act, or say, speak, speak, say anything, act in any way, or even think, ask yourself, when I'm doing this, what's going to result from my actions? Is it going to lead to harm and suffering, either for me or for other people? If it, you see that it's, foresee that it's going to lead to harm and suffering, you don't do it. If you don't foresee any harm or suffering, then you go ahead and do it. But while you're doing it, again, you ask yourself, what results are actually coming from my actions right now? Any unexpected harm? If you see any unexpected harm, you stop. If you don't see unexpected harm, you continue with the action. Then after it's done, you're still not done. You look at the long-term results of your actions. And if you see any long-term harm that was done, it's a, then you go and talk it over with someone else on the path, and then you make up your mind that you're not going to repeat that mistake. If you don't see that you've done any harm, okay, then you take joy in the fact that you're succeeding in your training, and then you use that joy as uh, motivation to keep with the training. So this way you, you get more and more used to looking at your actions. The Buddha says you look at your actions in the same way that you look at a mirror. 
You see the, the skillfulness of your intentions by the actual results of your actions. So here you're judging your actions both by the intention and by the results. In the same way that, say, a, someone who is a carpenter is working on a piece of work. Um, you're, not, you're not a judge passing final judgment on yourself. You're basically, you've got a work in progress. And as you're working on, say, building a, a chest of drawers, you see how things are going, and you realize you've made a mistake, you go back and you correct it, and then you keep going. Okay. As you're doing this, you get more and more into the mind. You're focusing on your mind as the most important source of what you're doing. And here the Buddha says, you sh as you meditate, you should take the attitude of a cook. Now he says, an, a, a foolish, inexperienced cook working for a prince doesn't notice. Today the prince liked salty curry. Today the prince liked sweet curry. The pr today the prince liked sour curry. And because the foolish, inexperienced cur uh, cook doesn't notice what his prince liked, he's not going to get a raise, he's not going to get a bonus. Okay? It's the experienced cook who learns how to look at what the prince likes. Today, what did he ask for? Today, what did he reach for? Today, what did he um, praise? Today, what did he eat a lot of? And then tomorrow, you provide more of that. So in the same way, when you're meditating, look at what your mind likes, what it doesn't like. How is your breathing going? Does, it, does the mind like to stay with this kind of breathing? Well, if not, you can change. It's not like your breath has to be rice porridge every day. You can have deep breathing, you can have shallow breathing, heavy, light, fast, slow. In this way you learn to read your own mind, and as a result you get more and more skilled in your meditation. And the Buddha recommends that you continue looking into your mind. And here's, a, here's a quote. He says, Imagine a young woman or man, fond of adornment, examining the image of her own face in a bright, clean mirror or bowl of clear water. If she saw any dirt or blemish there, she would try to remove it. If she saw no dirt or blemish there, she would be pleased, her resolves fulfilled. How fortunate I am, how clean I am. In the same way, a meditator's self-examination is very productive in terms of skillful qualities if he or she conducts it in this way. Do I usually remain covetous or not, with thoughts of ill will or not, overcome by sloth or drowsiness or not, restless or not, uncertain or gone beyond uncertainty, angry or not, with soiled thoughts or with unsoiled thoughts? Have you ever divided your thoughts into soiled and unsoiled? <laughs> Lazy or persistent? Concentrated or unconcentrated? Now, if there are unskillful qualities, then he says, just as when a person whose turban or head was on fire would put forth extra desire, effort, diligence, endeavor, rest, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness to put out the fire on his turban or head, in the same way you should put forth extra effort, desire, diligence, endeavor, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness for, for the abandoning of your uns evil, unskillful qualities or thoughts. But if the qualities of the mind are skillful, then your duty is to make an effort in establishing those very same skillful qualities to a higher degree, to the point where you end all defilements. So this is how these are the kinds of questions that the Buddha has you ask. What, what's my mind like? And if you see if there's something some, unskillful there, you work hard to put an end to it. If you see something skillful, then you continue to not rest content there, but work harder to, to perfect it. Now the basic quality that underlies this, as I said earlier, is heedfulness. The Buddha doesn't say that we all have an innate good nature. Um, look for five minutes at the political situation in Thailand or in America and you would know that for sure. Um, he said, our skillfulness comes from heedfulness. Because you see, okay, I cannot allow unskillful qualities to stay in my mind because they can have a huge impact. He says, there's a case where a meditator as day departs and night returns reflects. Many are the possible causes of my death. A snake might bite me, a scorpion might sting me, a centipede might bite me. Centipedes in Asia, by the way, are huge. And they're like this and they really can do damage. Okay? That would be how my death would come about. That would be an obstruction for me. Stumbling, I might fall. My food digested might trouble me. My bile might be provoked. My phlegm piercing wind forces in the body might be provoked. That would be how my death would come about. In other words, he's saying death could happen very easily tonight. This might be my last sunset that I'm looking at here right now. Okay? And then you should investigate. Are there any evil, unskillful mental qualities unabandoned by me that would be an obstruction for me were I to die in the night? So if you see, and again, if you see those unskillful qualities, then you would try, as, and again, the Buddha uses the image of the person whose her, turban is on fire. You try to put them out as soon as possible. In this way you work on seeing more and more, with more and more subtlety, 
where the mind is creating unskillful qualities and what you can do to put an end to them. And this works finally all the way to the, what the Buddha said was the ultimate list of questions that you ask yourself as you're meditating. And here he's asking a group of monks, he says, what do you think? Is form constant or inconstant? And they say, inconstant. And is that which is inconstant easeful or stressful? And they say, stressful. And they say, is it fitting to regard what is inconstant, stressful, and subject to change as this is mine, this is myself, this is what I am? They say, no. And then he asks the same question with terms to feeling, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness. Okay, is it, is it constant? No. If it's inconstant, then is it easeful or stressful? It's stressful. And is anything that's stressful and ch subject to change, is it fitting to regard it as this is mine, this is myself, this is what I am? Now notice he's not asking you here to, to come to a conclusion as whether there is a self or is no self. He says, is it skillful, basically, to identify yourself with things that are going to change? Things that are stressful, things that lie beyond your control. And, it, and in this way, You can finally get to the mind to the end of its attachments, to the end of its clingings. And so, as you can see, that the, the path of practice here is basically a series of questions that you ask yourself about what is skillful and what is unskillful, and your standards for what's skillful get higher and higher all the time. So five lessons I'd like you to take home with you from this reflection tonight is, one, that heedfulness is the basis for skillfulness. You don't assume that you have an innate good nature, you don't assume that you have an innate bad nature. You simply see the importance of your actions. You try to develop a sense of urgency to keep your actions as skillful as possible. Secondly, the issue of skillfulness has many layers of subtlety that can be understood not simply by learning definitions of the word skillfulness, by observing principle of cause and effect in your actions. Um, I can make an analogy with um, some signs I saw in Alaska several years back. You know, in Alaska they have a lot of problems with tourists coming up from the lower 48 who know nothing about the Alaskan wilderness, and especially nothing about bears. Okay? So they have signs that are called Bear Awareness. <laughs> and really, um, <laughs> and they give you a, a series of lessons. Okay, if you see a bear, don't run away. Okay? Now your immediate reaction usually when you see a bear is like, gotta get out of here, but they say, no, don't run away because the bear will see you as, as game and will chase you. Okay, if the bear looks over in your direction, raise your hands high over your head and speak in a very calm, reassuring voice to the bear. Okay? <laughs> um, by raising your hands over your head, your bears can't see very well, they'll think you're tall okay, and big. And your calm voice will reassure them and they will go away. Okay? Now if the bear doesn't go away, if it actually comes charging at you, then they say, uh, don't run, lie down, play dead. Even if the bear comes up and nibbles on you, <laughs> try to play dead. Now, but however, yeah, there may be a few cases where the bear is nibbling on you not out of curiosity but out of hunger, in which case they say, "Fight for all you're worth." Okay? Now, this requires a lot of mindfulness. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a good degree. But what it comes down to is that you know, there, the, the sign gives you a lot of do's and don'ts, but then at, there's one point it says, okay, you've got to use your own powers of observation. And it's the same way with the Buddha. He will give you some instructions. You know, don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat, don't have illicit sex, don't lie, don't, get, you know, don't drink alcohol or take drugs. And that, those are the, you know, the, the basic bare awareness kind of instructions. <laughs> but then the Buddha says, okay, s skillfulness has many levels of subtlety which you are going to learn only if you start questioning your own actions and really looking at the results. And as you get more and more perceptive here, your level of skillfulness is going to get higher and higher. All the way to that final questionnaire about not-self. And again, as I said, the Buddha is not asking you to say, conclude come to the conclusion, is there a self or is no self? Simply, is this particular attachment I have here a skillful attachment, or is it causing suffering? If it's causing suffering, why do I do it? Again, he's talking about skillful action, he's talking about karma. And as you get more and more perceptive about the results of your actions, you'll be able to get to that level in your, in your meditation. Third point that's important to take home is that following the example of the Buddha's quest, he encouraged people to question their actions as a primary means of attending the end of suffering, to the point I just made. 
you develop the path as a, to develop the path as a skill. And if you learn the general outlines of what skill is about, you can master the skill only using your powers of observation. Okay. The fourth point is that you have to need need to hold to ever higher standards for evaluating your practice. You begin with a level of acceptance and equanimity, just so you can learn to see what cause and effect are actually like. But from that point on, you have to keep raising your standards of what really is skillful. In terms, okay, if there's any blatant suffering you're causing yourself, get rid of the blatant suffering first. Once you've got rid of that, rid of that you say, because there's still any little subtle suffering in my mind, any subtle stress. And you keep pursuing that further and further, all to the point. Now, you have to, to begin with the ordinary level of you're to gain confidence, okay, that I actually can handle this, this issue of suffering and stress in my life, and to form a healthy sense of yourself, identifying with a desire to learn from your mistakes and to do what is skillful. And then from that sense of healthy sense of self, then you start taking it apart. But you need that healthy sense of self first. And then the as I said earlier, the purpose of acceptance is to learn what's actually going on. From there you cross-question yourself to, ga to gauge the skillfulness of how you can act, speak, and think. And this is the process that leads to the end of suffering and stress. So if you look at the Buddha's approach to how you question yourself, he starts with you know, the assumption, okay, I really do want to find true happiness. He's not, trying to, he's not working from the assumption that you're good or bad, but from the assumption you want to be happy. You don't want to suffer. And he's saying you can do this in an intelligent and a systematic way, by looking at your actions, by seeing the results of your actions, and trying to develop a sense of heedfulness and, and higher levels of what you might call um, sophistication and make, becoming more and more a connoisseur of happiness. You want more refined happiness, more solid happiness. And this way, your lack of contentment actually leads you ultimately to a place where then you don't have to worry about being content or not because you found a happiness that doesn't change. So those are some of my thoughts for tonight. I understand we have only five minutes left for questions. So, um, Has it sparked any questions in your mind? <laughs> um, I, I was thinking a lot about the statement you made of uh, uh, there are some questions that can be put aside, do not need to be answered. And <clears throat> once before, on a Monday evening, I asked if the Buddha, you know, believed or thought there was a God. Mm -hmm. There was God. Mm -hmm. And the answer was something like, mm -hmm. no, the Buddha thought that was not an important, skillful thing to even think about as sort of irrelevant, I don't know what words were used. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if indeed, uh, you know, you see that as one of these questions that uh, can be put aside, that it's not relevant to your everyday life, and, and, and all of that. Well, actually, the Buddha did say that there was a God, but he said God was irrelevant. He yeah. said that yeah, there was a, great, a God, a great, but a great he's Brahma. irrelevant? There's a great Brahma up there who thinks he created the world, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> God, God thinks he created the yeah, world. Yeah, but he but didn't. He didn't. Yeah. The story goes that there was, there was actually a higher level of Brahmas. And, he, um, and, and this, this is part of Buddhist cosmology, where apparently the universe goes through these cycles of, de of, 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 of evolution and devolution. And then most of, the, most of the layers of reality get burned up at some point, and there's only the lowest hells and the very highest heavens. And then as the world begins to evolve again, there appears this empty Brahma palace. And one of the higher gods, from lack of merit, falls from the higher level and gets reborn in this empty Brahma palace. And he's lonely. And at the point he says, you know, I'm feeling kind of lonely here. I'd really like to have somebody else. And some other gods happen to fall from the higher level and get reborn. And he says, oh look, I wanted these gods to be reborn, these people to be reborn. Here they are. I must have created them. And then they say, he must have created us because he was here first. <laughs> That's the Buddhist version of Genesis. 
or, or actually one of the versions. There's, a, there's another version, I'll tell you that another day. Um, but but for, from the Buddha's point of view, it's the, these gods, whether they do exist, you're, you're, you're friendly with them, you're polite with them, you don't want to cross them. But you don't worship them. In the same way, if you've got, you've got a troublesome neighbor who thinks he created the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> you treat the person nicely, but you don't, you don't worship the person. That was actually the Buddha's answer. Yeah, that was actually a question he did answer, but as I said, gives an unexpected answer. Um, no, the things he actually put aside were things like, you know, who am I? What is my true nature? Because if you answer it with a true nature, then you get stuck with your true nature. Either you've got a good nature, and then you've got the problems, well, if I have an innately good nature, why am I suffering? Or if you say, I have an innately bad nature, or if my nature is innately bad, then there's nothing I can do to help myself. And so he just puts those questions aside. There's a question behind you. Um, you mentioned that um, needing a healthy sense of self mm -hmm. for um, engaging in uh, questioning and mm -hmm. a certain kind. Um, so for someone who doesn't or somebody who may be in a space where they don't, how would you then approach uh, questioning? Um, have them develop a skill <laughs> of some sort and work on something that would, they, they would find manageable. Um, and then work up from you know, sort of basic skills to more subtle skills. I have a friend who was um, working with a group of former gang kids in a school down in Santa Ana. And she was funny, and she found that, you know, that they, they knew that they were in this school and they were going to be graduating from the school and they're going to go back into a regular school. And she sat down with them. She said, okay, look, what's going to happen when you go back to that regular school? She said, everybody in the school is going to be afraid of us. And she said, well, how are you going to put those people at ease? And they said, we never thought of that. And so she said, I'll show you how you do it. You walk up to the principal, shake his hand, look him straight in the eye and says, I want to work together, change my life, okay? And so she went through and basically taught them the skills, you know, some social skills that they hadn't had any, any practice in. And so this is how you have, this is how you develop a higher you know, sense of self worth. You can't just tell people, okay, feel good about yourself. You actually have to give them some concrete reason to feel that they're competent in different situations. And so you sort of figure out where they feel ill at ease or where they don't feel competent, and help them develop some competence in that area. And that way they'll, they'll develop a higher sense of you know, a healthier sense of self. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Um, according to um, contemporary depth psychology, a lot of the patterns of behavior that we engage in um, that tend to be self-defeating mm -hmm. are from unconscious, basically from the unconsciousness, childhood mm -hmm. traumas mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the, the story that you told sounds a, a lot like conscious selection of skillful behaviors. Um, how does that play with, with things like insecure attachment, which may be really buried in uh, areas that we're not conscious about. Well, you, you'll find as you develop greater skill in some areas, then you're more able to look back at the, some of those more threatening things that are buried in the subconscious because you're afraid to deal with them. But as you find have another area, it's usually finding another area where you develop a sense of self-confidence. And then building on that, then you're in a position where you can start looking. It's not that you're just kind of reprogramming a person in a behavioralistic kind of way, but you've there, there is an element of that. You've got to teach people some skills so they're not afraid of looking into themselves. I mean, this is, this is traditional in Thailand. It's not, it's not the case that everybody who goes to a meditation monastery gets to meditate right away. You know, if the teacher sees, you know, this person is not really ready to handle the stuff that's going to come up in the meditation, they'll have them work around the monastery, help with chores, and learn to... You get a sense of the confidence that comes from being generous with your time, generous with your skills, um, learning, leading a virtuous life. And then when you get that kind of level of confidence, okay, then you can start facing your demons. Because without that, without that level of confidence, you, you, you get scared. Are 
you afraid to ask questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Where's the nearest mic? Um, yes, I'm afraid to answer to ask this question. So um, here's a scenario that that plays out frequently with me. Um, I meditate every day. Um, you know, there's some stuff going on with my life that's difficult to deal with. Get into bed, have a full day ahead of me, and stuff starts happening. Mm-hmm. And um, you focus on my breath. Um, sometimes you get up and try to meditate. Mm-hmm. But the hours tick by, and the, at the level of agitation does not allow me to rest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... So, I mean, I understand if I'm not asleep, I must not need to sleep. Um, I understand the truth in that. And then if I'm really tired, I will sleep. Um, But what ends up happening is that I'll end up getting up and doing something, Mm -hmm. some chore that I need to do, I was going to do in the morning, and, you know. um, And it kind of releases some tension and allows me to focus on a physical activity. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, I feel, it makes me feel like a bad meditator. No. No, 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 no. (laughs) Because I feel that after, you know, that I should be able to sit and meditate and work through this agitation um, so that I can rest. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what, what your thoughts are about that. Well, a lot of this has to do with the conversation that you have with yourself about the fact that you're not getting to sleep. Mm-hmm. Are you berating yourself for not sleeping? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, then d- identify that as an unskillful member of the committee <laughs> who is causing trouble. And you say, I don't have to listen to this person, this idea. If I'm not getting any sleep, as you said, the other side that says, if, I, is, if I'm with my breath and I'm not falling asleep, I must not need the sleep. So I'll be perfectly fine sitting here, lying here awake, as I focus on my breath. And for all the berating that goes on, it's okay. that, that's, that's probably the big cr- uh, troublemaker right there. And if you do feel the desire to get up and just work on something, to work off the nervous tension, that's perfectly fine. I remember a, a monk I knew who was, said when he first went to stay at a monastery, he always looked down on the people who kind of pottered around in the monastery and cleaning this and doing that. And then he began to realize that you know they actually seem to be doing in their meditation, better in their meditation than the people who are meditating all the time. Because it helps ground you. As long as you're getting something physically done, that can ground you. So at least this is getting done. I have something I can point to. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I guess that's Oh, one more question. Yeah. Could you just, uh, for the benefit of those who are short of attention, the five points you were highlighting tonight, just ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. <laughs> As I was going through them, I realized I hadn't cleaned them up properly. Um, one is you've got to be heedful as a basis for skillfulness. Two is there are many layers of subtlety from skillfulness that have to be learned by observing the principle of cause and effect in your actions. And that's where the, the element of um, contentment comes in first. You're content to see exactly what is causing what. Because if you can't really look at your actions and, and see clearly, okay, X is causing Y, then you're never going to be able to learn how to deal with it skillfully. Um, okay, they're going to be you have to hold yourself to ever higher levels of evaluating your practice. So it comes down to basically three points that were sorted around those five. <laughs> so you've got to be heedful. You've got to look at your actions as your basic place where you're going to learn about what's skillful and what's not skillful. And the purpose of acceptance and equanimity is so that you can actually see those relationships clearly. And then finally that you have to lo- learn how to hold yourself to ever higher levels of and, and when you're judging yourself. And the word judging, I know, is really bad. Um, but the Buddha never shied away from it. He said, you have to learn how to... And, and again, it's not that you're passing final judgment on yourself. It's that you're, you're judging a work in progress. 
If you get more and more skillful at doing this, you can look at it and say, okay, here's something that needs to be corrected, I can correct it. It's like playing a piece of uh, piano piece. You, know, you, you make a mistake, especially if you're playing jazz, you make a mistake, then you figure out some way to make it sound like it was not a mistake. Um, but when you develop the sense of um, confidence that comes from starting on a lower level, and just sort of basic levels of skill, and then work up based on that, then you develop a sense of confidence where, where you can actually approach some of the deeper and more subtle levels of lack of skill in the mind. So those should have been the five points. Okay, okay well, thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Competent. Both, both. Okay, both. Okay, thank you for your attention tonight.